Well, hello, Morning Star Church. Thank you for joining us this weekend as we continue our series entitled Messy. We're glad that you've joined us for this online worship experience. But before we begin our time in worship together, I want to share a few things with you as our community of faith. The first thing I want to share with you is that if you're not connected with us, uh, with our student ministry, Lyft Student Ministries, uh, through our social media, we're connected through Band, through Instagram, and through Facebook. That's the way that we'll keep you updated on things that are happening within our student ministry. And speaking of student ministry, we, we want to thank our friend, Miss Riley Byers, for the wonderful job she did in working with our students. It was great to see what God did in and through Riley over the close to 10 weeks that she was here with us this summer. And I sure am proud of her and for the job that she did for us and for the relationships that she has built that were not just relationships for the summer, but will surely be uh, for a lifetime. Uh, this coming Sunday evening, or tonight rather, if you're watching this on Sunday at five o'clock, we're going to uh, do a special theme about dealing with disappointment with our students. Uh, over the last five months, there's been a lot of disappointment for folks, and we're not done yet, it appears, with things changing almost weekly. Uh, with school situations, with sports, and other things that are going on in their lives. We're going to talk about what it means through the teachings of Jesus to deal with the disappointment that life brings our way. And that'll be on Sunday night at 5, and we'll be done by 6.15. Some of you have asked and, and have already been supported in prayer and with your finances about our friend Jose, or Cuatro as we call him, down in Guatemala. He continues his treatment, and, and we're going to receive funds for him for about another week before we send our first gift to try to help with the medical expenses for that. And we also want to continue to pray for our friends Lori and Marshall as they continue this journey together that they are on. Uh, you can visit our weekly email, and Lori is also on Facebook, and you can see ways that you can support her uh, in prayer, but also through the church with a love gift or through the GoFundMe website for that. And I have some sad news to share with you. Our pastor, missionary pastor down in Zambia that we sponsor, Noel Labinda, uh, his father passed away this past week with malaria. And we want to lift that family up. And some of you have already been given gifts. You've seen a, a note on Facebook and Instagram that we have posted about that and also our weekly email. And we're trying to help with the final medical expenses and with funeral expenses for Noel's family and this uh, tragic time that they're going through right now. And I also want to say a word of thanks for everyone that's chosen to give uh, to our Pastor Discretionary Fund. Uh, this week alone, we've been able to help with some gift cards for groceries. We've helped with a couple of power bills, water bills. And uh, this is just a challenging time for people. And for those of you that have made a choice to give above your tithe to the Pastor Discretionary Fund, we are deeply grateful for that. We've even bought some clothes because, as you may not know, or you may know, uh, the Oak Mountain Mission right now is doing food, but they're not able to do clothes and things because of the COVID situation. So this, this is a way for us to help those, especially with back to school coming, some kids that are in need of clothes, and we've even bought some diapers this week. So thank you so much for those that choose to give to that, and we'll do our best to continue to serve uh, during this time that is anything but normal for us. But thank you for thinking of others and for giving in that way. So friends, let's join together as a community of faith and worship together today here online.
Turn your ear to heaven and hear the noise inside the sound of angels on the sound of angels songs and all this for a king we could join and sing all to Christ the King how constant how divine this song of ours will rise how constant how divine this love of ours will rise will rise Today I am reading from the New Testament book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 16 through verse 30. The English translation of the Bible from which I am reading today is the New American Standard Bible. Matthew, chapter 19, verse 16 through verse 30. And someone came to him, being Jesus, and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, well, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept. What am I still lacking? 
Jesus said to him, If you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so glad to be with you again today. And I've got my beautiful assistant, Katie, with me again today. Today, we're talking about a new story. It's called The Rich Young Ruler. Now, this comes from Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 30. Now, I'm going to read the story to you. And you might, once I start reading the story, you might re recognize it. We don't, it's not one we talk about a lot in children's ministry, but I bet you have heard it before. One day, Jesus was leaving on a journey. And all of a sudden, a young man ran up to Jesus. Now, this young man was a Jewish ruler. Now, he knelt down and he said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, first, Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God. Well, what Jesus was doing was he was testing him just a little bit to see if he believed that Jesus was of God, that he was a little bit more of a good teacher than just a good teacher. Then Jesus reminded the young ruler of some commandments that had been given a long time ago from Moses. These commandments, they were part of a law. They were, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, and make sure you honor your, your mom and dad. Well, the man said, now, I've kept all those commandments since I was a boy. Now, when Jesus heard this, he said to the man, well, you are still missing something. I want you to sell everything you have and give all the money to the poor. Well, he said, and then you will have treasures in heaven. And then I want you to come and follow me. Well, the young ruler he was very sad about what Jesus had said. He was rich and he had lots of possessions. He didn't want to sell his stuff. So he ended up not following Jesus. Now Jesus saw that the man had kind of walked away very sadly and his disciples come up, came up to him and said, um, well, we've done all those things. Well, if, but if the, if the rich can't inherit the kingdom of God, then who can? Who are we to judge? Then Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the, Jesus, the disciples were very, very surprised by this. And, and what Jesus meant by this, boys and girls, is he didn't mean rich people won't be in heaven. That's not it at all. What he meant was you got to love God more than you love your possessions. Love God more than you love your money. Being wealthy is not a sin itself. Everything that we are given is from God. So if, you, if someone is wealthy, they've been given everything from God. But as rich, the richer young, young, young ruler here um, figured out is that wealth can be a hindrance in your love for God. It can be a hindrance in you following God and following God what, what God really wants you to do. God has the people to change, God has the power to change people's hearts all the time. And he can do that. But salvation comes with his grace. And he enables all of the sinners to follow him. 
Now, boys and girls, he's not saying that we have to give up everything we have because God wants us to have wonderful things. He blesses us with these things. But he wants to make sure that we're willing to do that, that our hearts are pure, and that we are willing to give up all the wonderful possessions we have, all the wonderful things we have to follow him. And if those things that we have we're holding on to and keeping us from following him, that's when we need to get rid of them. We don't want anything to be in between us and God. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to say the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to lead our entire congregation um, in the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to count to three. Katie, will you count to three really loud for me? Sure. Go. One, two, three. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. See you later, boys and girls. Well, friends, today as we start part three of the Messy series, if you're a child of the 80s, you're going to love this because we're going to be talking about some things that you may remember from TV and from the land of toys with that. But some folks may look at today's text and ask, what in the world does the story of Jesus's encounter with this rich young ruler have to do with relationships? Well, we're going to learn today through the scripture text and through some of our discussion that our view on possessions and our view on stewardship has a lot to do 
with our relationships. And we're going to dive right into this. And we just had the scripture reading a few minutes ago from Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 30. And you had this young ruler, a young rich man, some translations say, that came up to Jesus. And the message that Jesus gave him was not necessarily about money, although a lot of people think that it happened to be. But it wasn't really about that. It was about his love for himself. And the scripture is very plain in which it says that the young man left sad or disappointed. And so I titled today's thing, Don't Be Sad, Get Glad. Kind of like the old uh, garbage bag commercials that Tom Bosley was in back in the 80s when they would have the sack that, uh, of garbage that would fall apart and the people would be crying and he'd say, Don't be sad, get glad. So we're going to talk today about what it means to live a life of sadness or to embrace a life of gladness that Christ wants us to have. Because the truth is, real life uh, and real love for others in real life, it denies self for the sake of others, just like Jesus did for us, so that each one of us could have the gift of eternal life. And so if you're following along with your notes page today, the first thing we want to talk about is the fact that in the society in which we live in today, there is a common phrase that's used. There is one that's called, uh, you go live your truth, or I'm going to live my truth. Well, the truth is many people believe in many forms of truth, but in the end, there is only one truth. And that one truth is the truth that God shares with us through God's word, through God's people, through circumstances and the ways of God. Now, the description of this young man in verse 22, if you look at it, the word that is used is neonsikos in the original translation. And that indicates that this guy is between 20 and 40 years of age. And he's some kind of religious lay leader, possibly of the Pharisee persuasion because of his scrupulous adherence to the Levitical law and among all the religious elite in the land. Such people were often well off because they were among the retainer class, well above what would be known as the common people. In the political situation in first century Palestine, the Roman occupiers allowed a form of what was called self-rule. And within Judaism, the religious leaders exercised much of that leadership. And this young man addressed Jesus with a title of respect. He called him teacher. Some translations in Hebrew would say rabbi. He saw the words of Jesus as helpful in learning the mastery of Scripture. And the young man evidently experienced a need in his life to perform some kind of righteous deed in order to assure him of having eternal life. So he has this conversation with Jesus. And Jesus gives him this representative listing of the law, including five of what we would know as the Ten Commandments. And then he gave him the second of what he called the two greatest commandments in the eyes of Jesus. And this young man was very presumptuous to say that he had kept all of the commandments. But Jesus said, well, maybe not all of them. And he points something out to him. You see, the God, the little g God of a person's life is whatever rules his or her values, their priorities and their ambitions. The little g God of a person's life is whatever rules his or her values, priorities and ambition. Now, when we read this story, it's almost a given that this young man has given to the poor in the past because giving alms, that was one of the pillars of piety and, and righteousness within Judaism that was practiced in the first century, especially among the Pharisees. But among giving to the poor, you know, that can be done out of the abundance of a person's life. And it can give a person an even greater sense of power and pride to say, well, I gave this and I gave that. But when Jesus posed the question to him about giving up his possessions, he went away sad because Jesus had correctly pinpointed what was lacking in his life. You see, one of the things that if you've read the scripture story of Jesus in the Gospels, he didn't always ask each person that he asked to follow him to do the exact same thing. He was good at pinpointing specific weaknesses so that they could work on those and grow in those. Most of the people that he encountered, he didn't tell them, go sell everything that you owe. But Jesus, being God in the flesh, creator of all things, he knew the struggle that this young man had. Now, his many possessions, now that would have been his money, his houses, his land, his livestock. Those were typically, even back in the days of Abraham, seen as your wealth. 
And the lack that this young man sensed could not be filled with any of his wealth or with his own religious efforts that he had tried in order to keep the law. It could only be filled with the perfection that comes through entering the kingdom of heaven because he longed to have that and experiencing the inner transformation of heart, of mind, and of soul. And those things right there, that will set him on the path to be perfect as the heavenly father is perfect, as Jesus said. But this wasn't what was happening in the life of this young man, and he knew it. And so he went to Jesus, and he had these important questions for him. And what Jesus pointed out to him was that the young man, he didn't really own his possessions. His possessions owned him. And that was the issue that Jesus was pinpointing for him. That interchange that Christ was calling for would produce a transformation from the inside out if he was willing to part with the things that was hindering his relationship with God. And one of the points about this story is that God intervenes to do what is humanly impossible. God intervenes to do what is humanly impossible. This kind of transformation, it happens from the inside out. And Jesus was hoping the best for this young man. And to illustrate the difficulty of a person that's consumed by possessions, where they no longer own their possessions, but where their possessions own them, Jesus drew this analogy of a camel. And the reason Jesus would have used that analogy of a camel was because the camel was the largest land animal in all of Palestine. Now, if Jesus had been in North Africa, he would have probably said an elephant. But because he's in Palestine, he's going to say the camel. This is the largest land animal. And the eye of the needle, that was not necessarily a thread needle, although a lot of people use that illustration. But they called the eye of the needle was the name of the smallest interest, entrance to the home there. One of the things that they did in the first century is when they built a house because of the invading armies and some of the bandits that would be there, they would be known to ride their horses or to ride their camels into the actual home with swords drawn to cause all kinds of conflict and pain upon the people who lived in the house. And so as a way to defend against that, they built the, the doors, the entries to the homes to where they were smaller, lower in stature, and you had to get down on your knees to go in and they made them narrow to where a horse or a camel could not enter. It was a form of defense, kind of like a uh, first century version of ADT security. And that was what he was talking about when he was talking about going through the eye of the needle. It was impossible for a camel to go through that. And the people, when Jesus was sharing that story, we're almost imagining a camel getting down on the camel's knees slowly and burly there. He's just trying his best to get through the door like that. And if not for the seriousness of this issue, this analogy would bring a chuckle to everyone that was listening to Jesus tell this story. They would laugh as they would envision the impossibility of this huge, humped, hairy, snorting, spitting beast squeezing through a tiny little entrance. It would have been a point of humor for them. And he made his point. And the point was that wealth was not the problem. Wealth was not the problem. It was the state of the young man's heart. Wealth was not the problem. It was the state of the young man's heart. Other people of means, like Joseph of Arimathea, he found salvation by becoming a disciple of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea had a lot of money, but his possessions did not own him. That was the difference between him and the rich young ruler. Even that despicable little tax collector, Zacchaeus, in the eyes of the people there in Israel, he had accumulated great wealth at the expense of his fellow Jews, but he found salvation in the invitation of Jesus. And Jesus never told him to sell everything that he had. But Jesus was asking then this young man that. It is possible when one opens oneself to God, to see great transformation happen. And the issue with this young man is that he did not love God with all his heart because he refused to believe in God and refused to follow God. He did not love God with all of his heart because he refused to believe in God and refused to follow God. And Jesus points out that he did not love his neighbors because he was unwilling to give to his poor neighbors. He did not love his neighbor because he was unwilling to give to his poor neighbors. As the scripture says in Matthew chapter 6, for where your treasure is, there your heart 
will be also. So how do we end up following the words of Jesus and not the belief system that this young man had of how my good works are going to make me a citizen of the kingdom of God and will get me into heaven one day? Well, there's some things that we can do that Jesus teaches, and we're going to talk about these over the next few minutes. One of the first things we can do is to live to give, not to get. Live to give, not to get. Because giving, not acquiring, is the lifestyle of a person who is sold out to Jesus Christ. Giving, not acquiring, is the lifestyle of a person who is sold out to Jesus Christ. Because God's concern is not the amount given, but the motive behind the gift. God's concern is not the amount given, but the motive behind the gift. Now, you may not know this, and you may, but many will give so that others will notice. That happens a lot these days. We give big donations to have our name put on a building or something like that. But you know, that was going on pretty much in Jesus' time as well. Because the temple in Jerusalem had metal containers for people to put their offerings. And paper currency, that wouldn't be invented for over a thousand years after Christ. And when the metal coins were placed in the metal containers... Many would let the coins drop in as loudly as possible to broadcast their generosity. I mean, it was a sound like a trumpet. And Jesus basically said, if you are giving just so people will notice, then their praise will be all the reward you will get. The Father isn't honored by that motive. You see, friends, God is far more concerned with our motive for giving rather than the actual gift. And the rich young ruler struggled with that. Now, not too long ago, there was a production company that did a dramatic presentation of what if the rich young ruler had been at the foot of the cross and heard Jesus forgiving the criminal on the cross and giving him this promise of eternal life when he wouldn't give it to the rich young ruler. And here is that video. Let's watch this together. Oh, yeah. No, I heard what he said. I heard all too well what Jesus told that man, that, that thief that he was hanging next to. And you know what? It was drastically different than what he told me. You see, the day that I encountered Jesus, I dropped to my knees right in front of him. He had my respect from the start. You see, I wasn't looking for a handout, okay? I explained to him that I had done the hard work. I just needed to know, was there something that I was missing? Was there there some good thing that I needed to do in order to inherit eternal life? And you know, (laughs) sell all that you own. That's what Jesus told me. Sell it all, and you'll have treasure in heaven. (laughs) Yeah, right. You see, I was always taught that salvation is a reward for a life that is filled with good works. It is not a handout that you give to people that can't muster up up. They can't muster up enough character to earn it themselves. My wealth is a clear indication of the favor that rests upon me from God. I had asked about eternal life and this, this disgusting shell of a man, he's the one that gets it? Jesus told him the day he died, he would be in paradise. This man couldn't bleed a drop of goodness that he hadn't borrowed. No, no, that he hadn't stolen from the righteous man that he's hanging next to. He was a thief and I'm the one that is treated like I've been robbing God all along. I offered to do what I needed to do. This man offered nothing. 
All he could do was ask for mercy. And, and that's how he got salvation. That's how he got eternal life. It was just, it was just given to him. Like, like it was a, a gift. That's a pretty powerful video, and it shows just how our human nature can be about trying to understand things in our mindset, not necessarily in God's mindset. He was kind of bitter, and he was sad, and he was disappointed. So how can we make sure that we don't carry that mindset around? How can we make sure that we're someone who's a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, but also the citizen of the kingdom of God right now, and that we're pursuing the ways of God and everything that we're doing? Well, I think one of the ways for us to start as followers of Jesus is to understand that generosity is both a hard attitude and a habit. Generosity is both a hard attitude and a habit. God calls us to give generously, to give generously. Friends, we should give out of a heart of gratitude for what Christ has already given us. As Paul told the church in Corinth, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. In other words, if you want to be able to get tremendous blessings, then you need to be able to give tremendously and trust God to bring that all back around for you. And then we're called to give cheerfully, to give cheerfully. As Paul continues in his letter to the church at Corinth, he says, Each one must do just as he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. When we give, we want to be excited about it. We want to be upbeat about it. We don't want to be, oh, I have to give because that's what Jesus says I have to do. We want to do it because we want to serve Christ and we want to do it with a spirit of excellence. And one of the biggest things that many people do now when they Come, when they think about how they give and what they give, we're bad to compare our gifts to the gifts of others, to the contributions of others. Friends, that's a deadly trap. So let's try to not compare. Don't compare. Don't compare your gifts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul says, For if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. If you don't have it to give, God doesn't expect you to give. But there's lots of things that we can give. And when we do that, we give something that we value. We give something that we value. For some, they have a lot of financial means and they can write a check and it's not a big deal. But for others, any amount of money is a pretty big deal. But we're still called to give. So that can be our time. That can be our energy. That can be our possessions. Back in the 80s, there was a very popular toy and a very popular cartoon called He-Man, Masters of the Universe. And you may remember that if you're a child of the 80s. And I was like most boys that were in, in, you know, in that time frame of seven to nine years of age. And I wanted all of those He-Man toys and the Castle Grayskull and the Snake Mountain and you know, all the accessories with that. But we didn't really have the means to get those kinds of things. Although I did finally get a Snake Mountain when I turned 10 for Christmas. That was a big deal uh, for me. Never did get the Castle Gray Skull. But I had been saving up, and at the time, with tax at Walmart, back when the colors were orange and brown, not blue and white like they are now, but orange and brown, I could get a uh, He-Man Masters of the Universe action figure for $5.68. That was tax included. And I had been saving up in order to get this specific toy uh, named uh, Ram Man. And this was a toy, a, a He-Man action figure that had a, a spring in it. And he would spring and you could knock him into the wall of Snake Mountain or knock him into the wall of Castle Gray School. And he could do all kinds of cool things like that. And that was a lot of money to buy Ram Man. And so I had been saving because if my mother had tried to buy that, that was two hours of, of pay for her. Uh, from the garment plant. That's how much money that would have taken to buy that piece of molded plastic toy. 
But it was important to me. So I saved up every dime, every nickel that I could get from someone or that someone gave me something for my birthday or, or if uh, my next door neighbor, Aunt Margie, gave me some money for candy to go down to Mr. Gray's store, I wouldn't buy a lot of candy. I'd save it because I wanted to get the Ram Man action figure. And then we had this mission expo in which we would have different missionaries each night for a week and they would come in and share about their ministries and what they were trying to do. And we had a specific missionary there that night. I'll never forget his name. His name was Eddie Payne. And he was serving what at that time was known as the Ivory Coast. Now it's called Coteau de Ivory. And uh, he was serving in the Ivory Coast. And he had a cool display with pictures. And I remember specifically he had a, uh, a, a mounted piranha, the stuffed piranha. And that was just the coolest thing ever. But then he showed this slideshow. Now, to some people, it seemed like this slideshow was 18 hours long and would never end. But it was the old kind of slides that would drop in the tray and, and would flash up, and you could watch that. And there was a specific slide that he showed of children who were my age. And I noticed that they had things going on with their physical body that, that I didn't have to be concerned about. Starvation. Uh, bloated bellies, uh, botulism, malnutrition, that was just unbelievable. And watching that image and hearing Eddie Payne speak that night about missions, it moved my heart in a way that I had never really felt it before at that age, uh, at that point in my life. And so that night, I, I felt God saying, you need to take that money that you're going to spend on Ram Man from He-Ban, Masters Universe, and you need to give it to Eddie Payne, the missionary. And, of course, the fleshly part of me was saying, my goodness, I don't want to do that. But it boiled down to one question. Do I buy the toy or do I help little kids like me in need? Do I buy the toy or do I help little kids like me in need? And you see, what I have found truthfully in life, even if I, as I have gotten older, when I feel God leading me to do something, I still have a, the question pop up because even though the toys or the things that I liked, would like to have are no longer little pieces of molded plastic like Ram Man from He-Man and the Master Universe, the toys get bigger. Would you like to have a nicer vehicle? Would you like to have a nice boat or maybe a place to go with your family or maybe a very, very, very nice vacation? Do I spend the money on that or do I try to be a good steward and to do something worthwhile for the kingdom of God? The toys... It's the same principle. The toys just get bigger and more expensive in life. And those are the things that we have to try to answer as followers of Jesus and how we see relationships and how we see each other. Because I may never meet the little kids that benefited from that very small gift that I gave that night. But to God, it mattered. And it did something within me from a spiritual sense that has forever changed the way that I view missions, not just locally, not just regionally, but also internationally. And one of the things that I learned that night was that selfless love destroys the mistrust in our hearts toward God. Selfless love destroys the mistrust in our hearts toward God. We think that if we give something up or if we give away this, that there's no way that God will be faithful enough to make sure that we're taken care of and to make sure that we have everything that we need, which are usually just things we want right? And the scripture addresses this in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, unified in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with a God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason also... God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, friends, this young man, he knew the law. He knew things that he should be doing. But in the end, he did not believe God. He did not trust God enough to be able to give up possessions that really owned him. He didn't believe the promises of God. And not only was the young man a lawbreaker from the very law he was trying to keep, but he had a major problem of unbelief. We struggle sometimes with unbelief. The writer in Hebrews reminds us of this. In Hebrews 11, he says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Friends, in today's society, there's way too many people that are like the rich young ruler that came to Jesus in this story. We long for the privileges of everlasting life. I mean, who doesn't want to go to heaven? But we're just unwilling to put Jesus first in this life. And not every person is required to give up all wealth, but this young man had made riches his little G God and was in fact breaking the first and the second commandments that Jesus said were the greatest. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Riches, possessions, these were his idol. Paul reminds Timothy about this in 1 Timothy chapter 6. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Friends, just as Jesus laid down his life for us, we're to lay down our lives for, this, for his sake and for his kingdom. Just as Jesus laid down his life for us, we're to lay down our lives for his sake and for his kingdom. Did you know if we're saved by our good works, then there would be no limit to what God could ask of us or put us through in this life. We would kind of be like taxpayers uh, with rights. We would have done our duty, and now we would deserve a certain quality of life, and Lord knows we would demand it. But if it's really true that, that I'm a sinner and that you're a sinner, and if you're a follower of Jesus, that we're saved by sheer grace at the infinite cost of God, who gave up everything to give God's life for us in the form of God's Son, Jesus, then there is nothing that God cannot ask of me. And when we really understand this, I mean really understand this, then we see how it impacts all of our relationships. The greed involved with our resources drives a wedge into all of our relationships, especially with God and with our neighbor. The greed involved with our resources drives a wedge into all of our relationships, especially with God and with our neighbor. Friends, it is difficult to find the time to love others when all we care about is loving ourselves. And it is difficult to invest and to love others when we, all we care about is investing in ourselves. Are you a person whose possessions own you? instead of you owning them? And that was the big question that the rich young ruler had. And because he viewed possessions as his most important item in life, his most important end-all, be-all, his relationships would suffer. Most every week, I meet with people, even young people, who wish that the ones that they love, whether it be a parent, whether it be a spouse, grandparent, whoever, would focus more on, instead of leaving money or pr providing this, providing that for them, would focus more on investing and in building a relationship with them. Because the money, it will never buy a meaningful, a deep relationship. And if we want to get relationships right, if we want to love God and love others the way the Scripture teaches us to do, we have to learn that people are a lot more important than the possessions. And because people matter to God, they're to matter to us a lot more than any possessions. And so today, don't make that same choice that the rich young ruler made and he walked away sad. Don't be sad. Get glad in the fact that God has given you so much that you can make a choice to say, 
you know, these are things that I can give, I can invest in others. Friends, choose to be a giver and invest well in the lives of others because the world already has enough takers. Let's not add any more to that count. Let's choose to be givers today and to get down in real life and to serve well and to invest well in others because that's what God requires and that's what Jesus taught and that's what Jesus lived for us and he expects us to follow that way as well. They say that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And your heart is where you hide your greatest love. Now you can be that love on earth, where thieves may steal tomorrow. You can take it to that hiding place above See there's a treasure at the end Of this narrow road I'm traveling And it gives me a purpose for my life My treasure He's the reason that I'm still living And He's gonna be my reason When I Be my 
Here are our questions for reflection this week. How many forms of truth do you believe exist? How many forms of truth do you believe exist? Do you have any little g gods you are able to identify today? Do you have any little g gods you are able to identify today? If you have chosen to be one who lives to give and not to get, what kind of transformation have you seen in your life as a result of this choice? If you have chosen to be one who lives to give and not to get, what kind of transformation have you seen in your life as a result of this choice? Why do you believe generosity is so important to the faith journey? Why do you believe generosity is so important to the faith journey? Why is generosity so important when it comes to our relationships? Why is generosity so important when it comes to our relationships? From the rising of the sun To the going down of the same The name of the Lord will be praised From the rising of the sun To the going down of the same name of the Lord will be praised. So praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name Well, Morning Star Church, thanks for joining us this weekend. I look forward to worshiping with you again, again next week as we conclude our series entitled Messy, because loving others isn't always easy. So blessings on you, and we'll see you then.